We are live. Um, hello, I'm Nancy Sheed of Sheed Communications, and I am thrilled and excited um, to be sitting here today with Terry Trespicio. Did I say that right? Yep. Oh, so good. Uh, <laughs> Terry is a writer, author, speaker, comedian, and all things uh, fun to be around. And I um, had been catching up with her this summer, and we were talking about writing and projects she was working on. And um, I, it was too much good stuff not to share with everybody else. So I am excited to say welcome, Terry. Thanks Thank for being here. And if you don't mind, share a little bit about sort of how you describe what it is that what you do um, and and how like sort of what you're doing right this minute. Yes, right. Me. Well, and, and you know, when you work for yourself, it kind of changes. Like sometimes year to year, you're like, mm, now I say this, like, it doesn't matter. I don't need to have business cards reprinted. It doesn't matter. Uh, but I, I technically call myself um, a writer, speaker and brand advisor. And it's basically, you know, you can talk to a lot of people. It's a lot of, a lot of brand specialists and strategists. But the way I do what I do, I made it up based on the bag of skills I had as a former magazine editor and broadcaster at the Martha Stewart company, um, at Martha Stewart Living Omni Media, where I was for many years. And then I got laid off. Like, oh my God, now it's, I've been gone longer than I was there now. So now it's feeling wow. very distant shore. Uh, but when you get laid off by a magazine, usually what people do is they go get a seat at another magazine. And I was like, man, I've already done that job. So I didn't go back. I didn't get another job after I got laid off, I started working for myself and making up as I go. And that was now several years ago. Like, but what I do now and the way I describe it as after you work for yourself, as you know, Nancy, after a few yeah. years, you start to shake off the things that you, you thought you had to do. And you're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I know what my sweet spot is. And I love to help people articulate what it is they're trying to communicate with the world. Sometimes they know and they have trouble articulating it because they're so close to it. And sometimes the person isn't totally sure and it helps have someone on the outside to kind of walk them through it. So whether I'm helping them explain to themselves or someone else, that has become my real sweet spot. I'm platform agnostic, medium agnostic. It doesn't matter whether you want to do it first, huge, that, that, the other. I think, I mean, one, I love that you've sort of let the world know when you work for yourself, you do make it up as you go along. And that's- 100%. Yeah. Um, and that's now to totally fine and acceptable. And it took a lot of us a lot of time to get okay <laughs> with that, that we didn't say, I am a, this is what I am. So right. I, I love that. But I, I think the other thing that's helpful um, I love that you're, as you said, just agnostic to the medium, the platform or whatever. So um, it just, again, to paint more color, you would be working with somebody who, you know, I typically work with kind of authors or thought leaders, which yeah. also your sweet spot. So when people say, you, know, you say brand advisor, you're, I hate to use the word personal brand, but you're a brand advisor to people, right? Not, people and companies. companies. It doesn't, it doesn't actually matter. I mean, I happen to have done a lot of work in the financial services industry. Why? Because I got invited to speak at one of their events and I kept getting invited back and I met people there. And if, I always say if I got in, invited to a dog walking convention, I'd have a lot of dog walking clients. Like it's a matter of who you meet when, yeah. but for firms, I help them say what they do in ways they never thought of mostly in the financial services industry, they're painting with the same three colors. They all say the same thing and then they wonder why they don't stand out. But then the same thing goes for consultants and coaches yes. and speakers and writers of all stripes that they're like, I think I do this, but I don't know. And so helping to articulate that, helping that get out of the person so they can gain clarity on it, whether it's for the corporate brand, which is just a group of people or a brand of one. Yeah. So that might right. be the writing, the talk they want to give. To me, it all comes from the same thing. It comes from the same clay. You're the clay. How you shape different parts of it depends on who you're trying to reach and why. I I, I think that's important. That So that was, you're, you're getting into, um, I'm going to put it in my fancy manner. So um, to your point, and you always keep going back to this, is like, well, it's all about the writing, right? Like it doesn't matter what it's for, right? It so doesn't it, matter. It doesn't matter what it's for. But um, when you and I were catching up, why is writing so critical right now? And or why, you think people have spent this time like going in or, uh, you know, why now more than ever is this becoming critical? And or are people coming to you more in terms of the, yeah. is, is it a message? Is it their personal brand? Is it all of the above? Well, to me, 
it could be anything. I mean, it depends on what you like doing. Some people love the idea of building marketing funnels. They want to build machines that they throw things in and money comes out the other end. Magically. Uh, and Just that's magically. fine. If you could, if some people really like working on the machine. In my world, and the people who come to me are people who know it starts with, what am I actually saying? Why should someone listen? Why should someone spend time or money to take what I have to offer. And so since we can't just walk around and go to events right, right now, like you have to be able to communicate it. Now there's things like this, interviews, podcasts, you can do your own videos. That's fine. But it starts with the idea. And the one path I know of to get an idea out of your head and into the world is through the page. Even if you are going to broadcast it, you probably sketch a few things down. You probably think about what story you want to tell. To me, it's all writing. And you don't have to be someone who identifies as a writer to do it. But that's where people get hung up, I think. They do, well, I'm not a writer. Da, da. You can hire writers, but if you don't really know and haven't done the work of really thinking about and writing out, what am I trying to actually say to someone? There's something that happens when you take ideas and pour them onto the page. And it can be really edifying and clarifying. Um, you, you've jumped ahead, but I mean, you, you, were, you didn't jump ahead. You've led into, like, I, I think a couple of things. One, people who don't identify with being a writer, right? Like, so I can't write, I'm not a writer. I never learned writing, I didn't take English. Um, or the, I, I have a lot of things to say, it, I'm just, you know, uh, I'm stuck or I'm blocked, right? Or they love writing, but they're afraid other people won't love their writing or, you know, like all that stuff. But inherently, do you think there's sort of one, you know, is there one thing, I know it's different for every person, but are there, have you seen common threads in your work where th these are the, these, these are the main places where people get stuck? Yes. Yes. And actually a good bridge to that is the fact, and you asked, and I don't think I answered it clearly, is in this day and age when if you are working for yourself, if you're lucky to be in the position to do that, uh, you have to write posts, you have to write emails, you have to be able to spell out what it is you want to do. And so what stops someone from doing that? Well, there are a few things. One is people think they have to write the book, write <laughs> the talk, write the email campaign. First, you don't sit down to write a book or a campaign. You just sit down and you write one line or you write a few lines, you write a paragraph, you write a scene, you write some thoughts. You only write one little part at a time. And then you take that stuff and you decide who, how would I say this if I was saying it to this person or that group of people? But this idea that I have to do it all and it's so hard, well, we make it hard for ourselves. Right. But of course, the uh, we focus also more on thinking about it instead of writing. Uh, the, the method that I have been trained in and used, which is called the gateless writing method. I did not make it up. I learned it. It helped change my life so much from a writing standpoint that I got certified in this method and now, now have workshops and teach it all over the place. The idea, the simple idea being this, when you can tap that kind of juicy creativeness, that flow, when you're like, oh my God, yes, this feels great. You don't have to have majored in English to have that feeling. You can have that feeling, but it doesn't come from thinking about doing it. What we do is we write in timed blocks. So I go, okay, like with my group, okay, ready? Here's your prompt. You have 15 minutes. Just go. You And you don't take time to worry, is this good enough? Why Am I not good enough? That critic that inner critic and that voice in our heads that gets in the way of us writing, right. we do not have time for that. So, you know, people talk about, oh, don't want to procrastinate. I want to do it. I do procrastinate. I procrastinate judging the work. Okay. I put off the judgment. I go, great. You, I think I suck. Okay, great. Why don't I think about that later? Why don't I put off that later? And only focus on the writing first. Uh, and I'm astonished again and again about when you give someone 10 minutes, even five, I've done a five minute prompt. What comes out of them astonishes them. And it's not because they, well, they didn't know they had it in them because they right. never let it out. Um, and well, I, I, I heard two things. One, it's the, it's the, it's too big. Right. And the other, I heard the, I'm worried about judging, J judging it myself, Criticism. Talking, other people judging, mm -hmm. right? Like, so I can relate to all of those most, most oh, definitely. Sure. But I, I think, um, so 
this method you talk about, say it again, it's gateless. It's the gateless writing method. It was created and is taught by a woman named Suzanne Kingsbury, who lives up in Connecticut, um, who I've gotten to be very close with him and learned so much from. Um, that method has, is a specific approach. It's a technique where we do not allow, well, we write in a group. You can also practice it on your own, but I do them in yeah, online. Yeah, work. You I'm do it wherever. Right, right. But for those of us that need accountability. No, no, could totally. And you get, you're in the group and you, we do it virtually and you write in real time. You're given a prompt, you write, and then you read your stuff out loud, unedited. Uh, it's brand new. We all know that we all create something rough. I've been writing this way for probably seven years now. And, really? and you will be like, wait, it's scary, right? But here's the thing about this method. No criticism, no questions no assumptions. And we don't talk to you, the writer, after you've read it. We talk about you. We talk about the work and we only point out what's working. We talk about craft tools. We talk about the insights that are coming out of the piece. You know why? Because most of us were never told what was working. We were only told this comma shouldn't go here. This isn't clear. Fix this. Do this. We, wow. we grew up having our pages lacerated, bleeding red ink, and we never really knew, well, was there anything good here? And so people are scarred for life. They can't write a damn thing because all they can think of is, is this wrong? Is this wrong? It's one of the biggest disservices we do to people period, is we make them afraid of the page, and then they are not able, for usually a long time, to actually own their voice again. And so what Gateless does is tries to undo that. Now, I'm not over criticism. I'm still self-critical, of course, but I have a tool, and I have a tool for getting past it and getting at and knowing when I'm doing something well. I've learned to listen for what's working in other people's work, right. and I know what's strong in my own. But if you don't know what's strong, how will you keep doing it? And do you, I hear you say prompts, but do you, um, when you have the prompts, is this just literally to like, is it, is this more exercising and building the muscles or when you're doing this, is this with a project in mind and a goal? Oh, it could be either. I mean, I am, we're, as you know, working on a book now is a lot of it's being written now, but a lot of it was written. And I wrote the bones of that book on retreats in timed writing exercises. The heart of that book came from those exercises. It's like when I look at it, cause Suzanne, I'm working closely with her on the book too. And I'll go, remember that? Oh yeah, we did that in that Connecticut retreat. Yeah, I wrote that then. It happens in 20 minute windows. Really? And, okay. And it's been astonishing. So yes, your question was you write, you read it. Do you do, some people do it just to tap their creativity, just to get those things flowing. Right. Other people take it and you can, and I show you how you can take that turn into a blog. It could be a scene in a book. It could be part of your Ted talk, but it is where you get at that brilliance, that boom, that lightning moment when you're like, oh my God. And so I did, and people were like, want the prompts? You can ignore the prompt if you want, but people love the prompts because it gives you something to hold on to right. rather than write about something that happened today. Well, that, uh, I don't know. Right. But when I say to you, tell me about a time when you loved something in a way that really surprised you. Tell me about a time when you knew there was no going back. Tell me about an object that you grew up with that you loved, an object you can remember that you could describe to the letter and what it felt like in your hand. Why do you remember that object? And the things that come out of people, they're like, I, I haven't thought about it in 20 years. I didn't even know that. Now, they discover a treasure trove of ideas that they've just assumed that was boring that no one wanted to hear. And it's not true. That's where your TED talk is. That's where your book is. That's where the the jewels of your work lie. But no one tells you quite that they're there or how stunning they are. And so there they are, rotting in a back closet. Um, well, I, it it sounds like it works to me because I'm getting goosebumps when you ask those questions. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it, it opens people yeah. up. Like they just say that, and the writing that comes out of it, it's different than anything else. Uh, I've talked to people who've written a whole book, then they go on the retreat and they write stuff. They go, wait, I like my new stuff better than my old stuff. Yeah. Cause usually when you're writing and you don't, you worry, I have to over explain stuff. You don't trust the reader. You don't trust yourself. You're worried. You're worried about structure. Should a plot line or should I have that? You're worried about the machine out here when really all that matters is the juice that's inside of it. And I'm telling you, it's not unique to me. I've seen it over and over and over again. And it is fueling platforms and ideas and businesses and books and all kinds of projects. I would not have a book without it. Uh, uh, well, and I want to, I'm going to want to get to bigger in a second, but just finishing this thought, I think what you and I also talked about was because a lot of people either, 
had newfound free time for good or for bad, right? right? Like they got back to now I have time to do this writing, right? Like now, so I, I think it's going to be interesting to see, and I've been talking about this with the people, like what's what's coming and or the reason you and I've also been busy is they can now be working on that platform or that TED talk or oh, well, you know, rewriting their website, right? What else is there to do? In the middle of the biggest downturn in our economy, I filled this program to 16 people and I filled it three times in a row. I do a six week sprint. It is where we wait for six weeks and then I did it again and again and again. Now, obviously, not everyone is in a position to be like, I'm going to take an enrichment thing. I'm going to go write. right. But here's the thing. You can do it and you don't need oodles of time. I don't write for hours and hours a day. I sit down, I do maybe an hour. I mean, you, it is kind of like a da, 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 get in there quick before your inner critic goes, what's going on in here? Let me turn right. the lights on. I'm going to frisk everybody. <laughs> Once your critic comes in and starts slowing things down, you're done. You have to go switch tasks. Right. You but creep in there when you can get at the good stuff and fill your pockets before anyone, your critic catches you. I love that though, because you're also getting away of the like, I need to go have my, you know, cabin in the woods where I'm going to sit down and, you know, no. write, <laughs> write my memoirs and, you know, say how about all these 20 wonderful... minutes? How about I got it. You're in and you're out. Minutes, um, right? And how are things changed? I know you used to do retreats, uh, you know, literally like the in-person where you kind of can, can do yeah. that, but, but I'm hearing you say that's effective, not right now. but yeah, not no. necessary and people are still Doing well, I miss I would go on at least two, uh, one or two retreats a year, and I was running at least two retreats a year. And those are small and, you know, like fewer than 10 people. But this has been really fun because what I did is tipped that one intense weekend on its side and spread it out over six weeks. And so we meet and we see each other, you know, all the time because I offer two slots for the week. So people come and they write and it's created such a kind of intimacy, this wonderful bubble, because this, these rules, by the way, because if you were to come into a gateless workshop and you ask questions or say, you know what you should do with that piece, and you're done. That's not how we do it. We say, nope. Or if someone, imagine if you wrote a piece about um, a relationship you had with your mother and someone, and you're like, okay, now what does everyone think of this thing I just wrote? And someone goes, oh yeah, I can relate because you know, I was really close to my mother. Well, that has nothing to do with the work. Right. It takes us away. So when we're reading and listening to Nancy's piece, we only talk about that work on the page. The point is the writer doesn't feel, oh, was this not good enough? Was this not interesting? Yeah. You never feel that way. And so people leave their feeling so good that they just want to keep doing it. And the problem is with writing a lot, people say they don't feel like doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But I'm also can see and feel how that would go beyond writing, right? Like you're suddenly like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be adding those comments to other people in there. Well, if, if there, in it, right? there like, is a way to approach editing that doesn't make someone feel like, oh, like, you know, you hand someone your your opus and they send it back with a few added commas. It, it just, it feels like, man, that didn't feel so great. Uh, but people love the prompts uh, because it gets you kind of in the mode. You don't have to worry about like, what's important about me or what should I say? It's like, just focus on this one thing. So it is really fun. And so I'm having a great time uh, doing that and introducing that method to other people. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, fun and writing are not two words. I would ever, even, given what I do, still would ever put together. So I, that's the other reason I wanted to talk to you because you do make it so infectious and so inviting and feel accessible. So um, tell me how um, you had big news during COVID and you just mentioned it. I did, yes, I did. I. I did sell my first book. I, it's my first time ever. And uh, it wouldn't have happened without COVID because I would have been out trotting around doing other stuff. And instead, I had that time to really buckle down and um, focus on making it happen. And, and we can, did. Can I, may I ask a few behind the scenes about it in terms of sure. what? Do, do we, are we allowed to talk about the title? Or are we allowed, can you give us a little hmm. like sneak preview what it's no, about? No, it was public. I mean, it was once it's announced in Publishers Marketplace, it's not a secret and it okay. was mentioned there. So okay. obviously I, the book was sold to Atria Books at Simon & Schuster. It's due out in spring 2022. It is tentatively titled Stop Searching for Your Passion. That is the same name as the TEDx talk I gave five years ago, which did very well. And so they're no dummies. They're like, hey, the only thing you've ever done that anyone ever listened to was that. So like, let's stay close to that. So, and I had written a whole bunch of essays and things like that. So what I'm doing is now shaping it to fit what this is. And, you know, in a nutshell, if, if you are like me and thank God, this search for your passion is draining and makes me think I missed the bus to my life. Right. What, 
what do you do instead? How do you think about your life if you don't think it has to have this one singular driving thing? Because some people have that. Great. I Amazing. Most of us are like, am I? What am I doing? Is this the right thing? Uh, and there's right. considerable pressure on people to have some kind of tagline for their life's purpose. I don't know why this has to have grown out of consumer culture. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm exploring, the nature of what we're told to believe, why we swallowed this hole and believe that we're supposed to have this one pur purpose and be able to print it on an index card or a name tag and wear it around. Like that's not how anyone in the history of the world ever thought about their lives. They just did what they did, right? And so this book is going to, through story, through some humor, um, take apart some of those beliefs so that we can actually get to what it means to create a life of meaning. Uh, I, yeah. And, and as you said at the beginning of this, like for those of us that work for ourselves, like the pressure was even, I feel like it's even greater, right? Cause you've got to put yeah. it all out there and you got to, and, and as you said, like six months or a year later, I'm like, Oh no, this is what I'm doing now. And it's not that it's completely different for some people. It is completely different, but for some of mm -hmm. us, it's like, Oh, I'm just getting further along honing that. Or I tried this and it or actually you had worked to make better. Money. Or you had to take on clients that you wouldn't normally because you needed to make some money and there's no shame in that. But to add insult to injury and be like, well, I'm doing this thing now, this this project I didn't really want to do, but it pays well and you know it's not my passion. Who cares? You know what's great? You know what a passion of mine is? Uh, feeding and housing right. and clothing myself. Right. I'm pretty passionate about those things. Okay. So if you can do that, like I think we need, especially as business owners, to let ourselves off the hook a bit and be like, hey, like, can we find in whatever is in front of us something valuable and interesting? And can we do something with it to improve it to serve someone else? That's it. If you do that till the day you drop dead, God bless you. Exactly. And the people around us as well, as opposed to all these absolutely square pegs, round holes that everybody keeps sort of paying yeah. a lot of money to other people to help them figure out, right? I don't, I just don't think that we're lost. We're not quite as lost as we think, but we, in a way, have we been told to believe we're lost so that we right. need to buy into something that fixes us off? And I'm particularly sensitive to that about women because oh, I yeah. don't like this idea of women being told that there's something wrong or off with them if X, Y, Z. And it's like, why? Why does that have to be the answer? Why do I have to be broken to invest in things that that can be of service to me? We don't need to assume a default of broken yeah. or lost, you know, to make something matter. There's so many good nuggets in here. Holy moly. I can't wait for the book. I mean, oh. <laughs> well, yeah. we'll see. I mean, we're in the throes of it now. We're in the mud. We're kind of okay. dragging along, but um, so you're in full book writing mode. I mean, you you had part of it done, and you're now sort of finishing deadlines. Just for those, oh my god, who it's due at the end of the year. It is so not done in the least. And what I don't do is go. I'm going to sit down and write my book because that is a nightmare. I say, oh, I I dig like 15 holes, and I'm like, which hole am I going to dig today? This one, and I dig around, I dig around, and then that one feels good. I put that one away. I work on this one. I just keep nibbling away at it. If this is not swallow a house, this is like termites, like little bites at a time. Um, so for anyone else working on a book, like this idea that you have to muscle everything uphill at once is crazy. You can't, you only write, you only write one line at a time. Yeah. And can I, I mean, being the categorizer I'd like, when you're saying digging in those holes, does that look like chapters or they're just ideas? You're not even at the point of putting things. No, no, no. They're pages. Structure. They're real pages. They're real chapters. But and I think I know where the chapters end and begin, but mostly it's a collection of scenes over here. It's almost like you imagine a human or a mammal or anything grows, like a couple cells start to gather and stick together and then they grow an arm and they, then a heart starts beating. When I sense there's a body there, okay, then that is that thing. So I'll just, but it kind of grows organically around that. I, I do not go chapter three and then start type. I would lose my mind. I can't, I can't think that way. So I just like to pick around like, at different plates, you know? And it works and and you whatever's moving you at the time or what discovery you had or what you can bring to the table that day probably adds to- That's that right, sort of whatever happened that day, it's and whatever happened, you um, just so, keep doing it. Well, we will we will check back in on your on your book writing expedition or, and, and um, but how, if people wanna know more about the gateless writing method, how to just follow you and be entertained because you're really funny and hilarious well, and thank you. cool to follow or about like actually working with you. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you, Terry? Yeah. Well, if you want to, I mean, the, 
I created this for this purpose so that people who are interested could learn more about it. It's a short little ebook and audio guide. If you want to just listen to it, it takes about 20 minutes. It's called five, uh, five ways to unlock your creative genius. And it's at Terry sent Just easier to remember T E R R I sent me.com. You can opt into that there and then you'll be in touch with me. You'll hear about what's going on. Um, but I'm also on every platform. I'm pretty easy to find. So if you're interested in talking about your project, uh, or want to learn more about the sprint, then just reach out and I'm here. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to put those in the notes and wherever else this gets this gets published and make sure I put the, the URL. Um, thank you, Terry, 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 for your time. Thank you. We'll check in later. I hope um, you, your digging goes well. And um, we'll, we'll check in and see how the book world is, you know, at a, at a later date. But okay. I hope everybody um, connect with Terry followers. She's hilarious, wonderful person. And you are like always <laughs> a good time. That sounds terrible, but very true. <laughs> That's good. Good. Take, take care. Care. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Bye.